The saying goes that ignorance is bliss. And as I go through my daily routine, waiting for labor to kick in, and pushing through my now third week of prodromal labor, I'd say that is true with childbirth. I started filming as a distraction from the ongoing labor that just wouldn't progress, and also get my mind off the big question of, is this the day? All the while knowing that I'd probably still be pregnant and headed in for my scheduled induction the next morning. Today, I'm going to take you along as I labor and go about my usual homemaking routine, including making some cheese curds. And as I go, I'll share my thoughts on making peace with birth interventions as someone who really strives to do things naturally as a general rule. I'll also share some of the things I tried in case you're in a similar boat. And also one thing I didn't try, but has an 80% success rate. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, homeschooling and homesteading mama of seven on a mission to ditch the grocery store and become more self-sufficient. Subscribe to our channel to learn more about our journey and how we are making that dream come true. As a mom of seven, I can look back to my first birth and see how incredibly naive I was as to what was ahead, but also how content and comfortable for most of that labor I was and how confident I was leading up to it. I had read all the natural childbirth books and felt like I had it handled. As with most things we gain our confidence from books in, that quickly faded once I didn't go into labor after my water broke and the intensity of Pitocin-induced contractions hit. After 30 hours of labor with that first birth, I got an epidural, and although I felt defeated, I still believe that's what allowed me to relax enough to finally birth my baby. The crazy thing I've learned about labor and birth is that it's not about confidence in your skills or abilities or control. Ultimately, what I've learned in seven births is that everything goes better when control is given up so that your body's instincts and baby can do what's needed to complete the journey. The only skill needed is the ability to surrender and fully relax. And confidence in any book skills must go right out the window as you put your trust in your God-given ability to birth and his control over it all. But alongside that understanding, I also know that some anxiety and mixed emotions over an upcoming labor and birth are also normal. It's what breaks you down to that ultimate point of surrendering to the process. A unique thing about my seven births thus far is that aside from my first, I've always been induced at 39 weeks. This time, I begged to hold off until 40 weeks, and yet here we are, 40 weeks along, and still pregnant. I could say no. I could cancel the induction and hope that things go well on their own time. But with some health complications looming, including the risk of a cord prolapse, where the cord comes out first due to excessive amniotic fluid and my baby not engaging, I once again had to let go of control over having the perfect birth and instead focus on what was the safest plan of action for both my baby and myself. So as I go about my day on this day, I'm trying to have faith that the induction may be the best plan I never wanted. One of the projects I wanted to get done today was making cheese curds. I really love making cheese, but it is a pretty long process to get to the cheese curd stage, and frankly, at that point, I usually tell my family I'm going to finish it into a hard cheese because I can't stand to see all of those hours of work eaten up in no time at all. Today, though, it worked out well because I was pretty burnt out by the time I hit the curd stage and was grateful to be done. Plus, I knew I wouldn't be around the next day to continue the process of making a hard cheese. To make cheese curds, you first want to warm your milk to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm doing four gallons here because I had a ton of milk to use up, but you can just do two gallons and adjust the amounts given. I'm going to show you the remaining steps all together in this video so that you don't get lost, but know that this was something I was coming back to all day long. After the milk has come to temp, you're going to turn off the heat and pour in half teaspoon calcium chloride diluted in a half cup of cool water. Gently stir up and down for one minute. Next, sprinkle half teaspoon mesophilic culture across the top of the milk. I like MA11 for this, but any will work. Let it hydrate for about five minutes and then stir it in using up and down motions through the milk to mix in the culture. Cover the pot and set a timer for 30 minutes. Next, dissolve your rennet in a half cup of water 
and the amount of rennet will actually depend on what kind you have, so just check the package or bottle for instructions on how much to use for each gallon of milk. When the timer beeps, slowly mix in the rennet, stir for one minute, and let it sit covered for another 30 minutes. The next step is called checking for a clean break, and basically it means that when you insert a knife, the whey fills the hole and the cheese remains intact and doesn't fall apart. If it isn't there yet, just cover it and give it another five minutes. Once it's ready, cut the curds using any long knife into half inch chunks by cutting a grid pattern. This really doesn't have to be perfect. Then allow it to sit for five minutes. Next, start heating the curds very slowly to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want this to take a while, around 30 minutes. Stir every few minutes and break up any large chunks with your spoon. I really like this cheese spoon and consider it a necessary cheese making tool, so I will link it below. When the curds get to 102, turn off the heat and just let it sit at that temperature for 45 minutes. During this time, you're going to stir it off and on, breaking up any chunks. I usually start with the spoon while the curds are very soft and fragile, and then I switch to using my hands as they firm up. One thing I want to mention here is that you don't want to overcook them because too firm of curds will leave you with harder, drier cheese curds. They should get to the point of firm and no longer feeling like egg whites, but not much more beyond that. After that time is up, let the curds rest for five minutes. Then you're going to drain off all the whey, so you're just left with the curds in a colander. It is easiest if you use cheesecloth here, but I just forgot. Now place the colander over a pot of hot water and then add a gallon size Ziploc bag of hot water to the top. The idea is to keep the curds around 95 degrees. You're then going to flip the curds every 15 minutes or so for an hour. And if I had the cheesecloth in here, this would have been a little easier. Then cut the slabs into chunks, place them back in the colander, and repeat the process for another two hours. You're done when the chunks resemble a cooked chicken breast, and I admittedly cut the process a little short here because it was getting late and I was getting tired, so you really shouldn't see the outlines of all the individual curds like I have here, but it still turned out fine. Finally, you're going to take the slabs and cut them into half inch to three quarter inch chunks. Place them back into the colander, and then the final step is to incorporate the salt and whatever flavorings you want to add here while we soften the curds. So to do that, I sprinkle two tablespoons of salt over them, mix it in really well, and then place the curds back in the warmth. In 10 minutes, sprinkle another two tablespoons of salt over them, mix them up well once more, and return them back to the warmth for a final 10 minutes. At the end of this time, your curds should be done and ready to eat. These will be a great snack to have for the kids while I'm away having a baby for a few days. I also thought I'd get the house picked up and of course, Throw in some housework that just might trigger labor to kick in. This carpet is new and although I love it, it is really plush and a workout to vacuum, which didn't bother me today. I did get contractions and with each one, I would hold up my belly to see if that would encourage baby to engage. This is one of the many exercises I have tried from a website called Spinning Babies. If you are expecting, definitely check it out. One of the things I had planned to try but chickened out on is called Midwife's Brew. It's basically a castor oil smoothie, and apparently it has an 80% success rate. Unfortunately, the risks are horrible diarrhea and stomach aches, as well as the small risk of stressing out your baby and dehydration. I actually even went as far as purchasing all the ingredients, and then I just couldn't make myself do it. Another project I got done today was getting all the Christmas decor put away, which was a little hard to be honest because I had it in my head that it would all still be up when the baby arrived and that I'd put it away after I was up and about. It was just another step towards letting go of all of my well-laid plans. Around two, I was having a lot of contractions and actually got hopeful that they would turn into something, but no such luck. I kept moving though and decided to get dinner going. I think I've shared this recipe before because it's a family favorite. It's called creamy tomato chicken, but I actually made a mistake and my pregnancy brain got out and thawed chicken legs instead of the usual thighs that I normally use. It actually turned out amazing though, and the whole family agreed that I should make it this way every time. To make it, 
preheat your oven to 400 degrees, and then mix a fourth cup of cornstarch, a tablespoon of salt, and a teaspoon of ground pepper in a bowl. You're then going to coat the chicken pieces in the mix. Like I said, I usually use chicken thighs, but legs are great too. You also want to pat them dry if the coating isn't sticking well. Then set those aside while you slice up an onion and dice two cloves of garlic. Next, add a little oil to a Dutch oven and brown the chicken pieces on all sides, setting them aside as you go. Then add a little more oil, scrape any chicken pieces off the bottom of the pan, and add your onion and garlic. Saute this for a few minutes, then add in a cup of dried tomatoes, one teaspoon Italian seasoning, and a pinch of red pepper flakes according to how much heat your family likes. Saute it all together for another minute. Then add in a can of coconut milk and one cup of chicken broth. Mix well and bring it to a boil. Turn off the heat and add the chicken back in, making sure to get the sauce over the chicken as much as possible. Cover the pan with a lid and place it in the oven for 45 minutes. Then drop the temperature to 300 and cook for an additional 20 minutes. We like to serve this along rice or steamed broccoli, so I start that towards the end of the cooking time. While dinner was cooking, I decided to go outside and get some fresh air and see if a walk outside would help. It definitely made the contractions intense, especially in the uneven snow, but still, as soon as I stopped, they would slow down. We had a late start to our winter weather here in Wisconsin, but there is finally snow on the ground and I think it is so beautiful. We usually get pretty harsh winters here, including several feet of snow, so Colin built this tunnel for the pigs so that the snow falling off the barn roof wouldn't block their entry, and it seems to be working great. After I came in, I got some work done while sitting on my exercise ball, trying to avoid sitting in any position that would hinder baby's ability to get in position for birth and hoping that it would help him engage. I also brewed a large batch of red raspberry leaf tea, which is supposed to help tone the uterus and make birth easier. It can also stimulate contractions, but I haven't really seen that to be true for myself. I also did something called the Miles Circuit, which you can Google, but it is also geared towards getting baby lined up correctly. Unfortunately for me, it still doesn't solve the problem of having a lot of fluid, so it didn't really seem to make a difference. I have heard many success stories though, so definitely worth trying if your labor is stalled. As the day started to wind down and it was time to serve dinner, I think the reality of what tomorrow would bring started to set in. I was, of course, so excited to meet my baby, but there were so many feelings about the birth and the induction process to go along with it. I'm trying to remind myself that ultimately, God is in charge, induction or not. If you're in a similar situation where your birth didn't go as you had hoped, let me just say that I know how frustrating the comment, all that matters is that you and baby are healthy, is. I think our births have a huge impact on our lives, but I hope that both you and I can make peace with changes and plans and see the beauty in birth no matter how it happens.